God dag och varmt välkomna till dagens webbinar om framtiden av den nordiska modellen. And also in English, a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today for this webinar in the series on Nordic scenarios, where we will talk about the future of the Nordic model. Given that we have English speakers in today's sessions, uh, we will be conducting the seminar in English. Men alla ni som föredrar att ställa frågor på svenska är varmt välkomna att göra så. So again, questions can be asked in any of the Nordic languages. Um, we will try our best to answer them, at least if they are in Scandinavian languages, that should work very well. We are um, hoping that we will have as interactive a session today mm -hmm. as we had when we kicked off the Nordic scenarios a few weeks back. So whilst we will be having four interesting speakers who probably all have more to say than could possibly fit within 90 minutes, we will also make time for question and answers after every two speakers. And we will take some clarifying questions also after every speaker. So we really encourage you to be active, um, post your questions, take an active part in the discussion today. And uh, on that note, I am now going to hand over to Lars Peder Norbacke from Civita, who will introduce us to the frame and focus for today's session. Over to you, Lars Peter. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Helen. Indeed, and uh, and well, and a hearty welcome to, to everyone viewing. Uh, in, uh, I would just like to make a few introductory uh, remarks before we really get going. So, uh, let me start by saying that um, I think we all know, in a way, that for some time uh, the world's eyes have been looking at the Nordic model or the Nordic models, in um, both in the broad and the narrow sense of the term with increasing curiosity and admiration. And uh, well, we can see and read books with titles like Viking Economics, The Nordic Theory of Everything, and also uh, titles like Free Market Welfare States, uh, which illustrates this trend, I think. And I, I think may, some of you might, may always also remember that economists sometime in 2013 um, carried a front page um, um, with the title The New Supermodel. It was, of course, about the Nordic countries again. And if we try to find proof about that, or something has gone very right in, in many in, in the Nordic countries, um, we, 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 we don't have any problems to, to, to find many uh, metrics and, 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 and so on uh, who gives proof of that. But I'm, if you look at how, how has the Nordics really succeeded to some extent, I'm reminded always about a, um, something that the famous British economist John Maynard Keynes wrote some time in 1926 in an essay where he was trying to uh, define the essence of politics. And he did it by writing that the essence of politics is to combine three things. Those three things being um, economic prosperity, social justice, and individual liberty. And um, that may be something that the Nordics have succeeded to some extent to do. Um, or to put it in more contemporary and perhaps also institutional terms, we might say that um, um, uh, the, the Nordics have, um, have a rather free and open economy and um, together with a universally oriented welfare state, and both are embedded, safely embedded in a very strong liberal democracy. And uh, also in a set of uh, power balancing labor market institutions. So um, talking about proofs, I will not uh, bore you too much about that, but I would like to just to cite a few metrics that really uh, has a tendency to speak a very consistent language about the Nordics being in the top league. 
And it goes through many, many diverse metrics that we, when we compare countries. Of course, we have income per capita. Uh, we have inclusive, inclusive economic growth, relative low income inequality, and a relative high degree of social um, mobility. And if you look at the indexes like the ease of doing business or economic freedom of the world or human and political freedom, we all know and where, where the Nordics typically are, are scoring. And that they also on, do on human development, health and social progress indexes. And indeed, when we measure self-reported well-being and uh, happiness. And not least, um, when we measure social institutional trust. This is all familiar, of course, and we'll not do uh, say more about that. So needless to say, when we are here now in this webinar and looking ahead, there's a lot at stake, right? We have all these qualities, not only, we have also some challenges which we'll get into. And um, when we look into the future, to the main windows we have, and I think in this project, we're very much looking to the windows of a green economic and energy transition, which is fundamental force of change, and also um, a changing patterns of globalization and technological change. And all these are uh, forces that the Nordic model going forward in the next 10 years will, will have to struggle with and cope with and hopefully succeed in. So in this webinar, we'll be asking the following question then in, in, in this setting. First of all, will, how, what will the Nordic social and economic model look like in 10 years? And what will determine the future competitiveness and sustainability of the Nordic model? And to help us explore these very important questions where a lot is at stake, we are very lucky to have a, a great panel with us of experts who will uh, explore these through somewhat different perspectives, but also overlapping perspective to some extent. And I will just um, um, talk you through the uh, four experts and speakers we have today. And starting with the first, um, and that is uh, Professor Stein Kundler, a professor in comparative politics at the University of Bergen in, in Norway. He will give his perspectives on the future of the Nordic welfare state, in a wide sense, the Nordic model, if you will. And then we will we'll follow up with moving more into the labor market and labor market policy and cooperation area, where we have been very lucky to have with us Mina Helle, who is uh, executive director industrial relations at the Technology Industries of Finland, and is indeed a former um, conciliator and has this unique experience that uh, with her. Um, and then we go and look at the dynamism issue, the competitiveness and the economic dynamism of the Nordic model moving ahead, which is certainly of very fundamental importance in order to underpin the welfare and the sustainability of the Nordic model. And here we have from Sweden, um, the CEO and professor Johan Eklund, who is heading the Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum in Stockholm. And um, they have done a lot of interesting research into these issues. So I think we'll look very much forward to, to, to listen to that. And finally, we our fourth speaker, we have the privilege of having someone looking at the Nordics from somewhat from the outside a little bit uh, and, um, and uh, with a perspective on the future of work. And um, so there we have Guy Kiddy, who is a policy, uh, 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 public policy researcher at Civita in a moment and a writer for The Economist covering the Scandinavian and Baltic region. So it's a privilege for us uh, to, to, to have this panel. And I think without further ado, I would just like to, to give uh, the, word, uh, to, the word over to Stein Kundler. Please, Stein. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with the last Peter that the Nordics must have got something right. As mentioned, as you already mentioned, the Nordic model have in recent decades attracted a lot of attention internationally. 
And I think the welfare state makes up a core element on what we call the Nordic model. I will give some general remarks from a political science view on today's topic, but I think we should keep in mind what a Danish colleague of mine once said, the Nordic model is a model with five exceptions. So why this focus on the Nordic experience? I suggest two answers. Firstly, because the Nordic countries with traditionally open economies, as you said, have in normal times relatively successfully developed and maintain comprehensive universalistic welfare states. Secondly, because the scope and character of the Nordic welfare states have been conducive to mitigating social and economic insecurity and risks in times of sudden exceptional international crisis, such as a financial crisis of 2008 and the pandemic crisis since last year. Although the Swedish case of crisis management of the pandemic has deviated from the other Nordic countries. I'll not go into that. The Nordic countries, as most other countries, were not well prepared for the pandemic, pandemic but comprehensive and administratively well-functioning welfare states have contributed to the resilience of the Nordic economies and societies. So are Nordic welfare states sustainable? What are the implications of the recent crisis for the future of the welfare states? I think we shall say that the Nordic welfare states are constantly being renegotiated and adapted to changing political, economic and social forces of change. And reforms uh, seem politically to, uh, to make, it's easier to make uh, reforms in, in the Nordic countries than most other countries. There's a much more of kind of consensual governance in the Nordic countries. Just look to France when they tried to introduce a pension reform on, on Russia. But the, what is the fundamental character of the universalistic Nordic welfare state changing? Given the current pandemic experience, I think it's likely that the state will continue to play a strong core role as authoritative welfare provider. The welfare state will most likely retain its basic universalistic character, but perhaps lose some of its egalitarian approach. Developments over the last 15 years with more private providers in healthcare, elderly care and education indicate a trend towards socially more differentiated welfare states. But how differentiated depends on how non-governmental, non-profit and for-profit welfare is politically mobilized regulated and integrated with public welfare responsibility. Health and education have high priority for most people and expenditures for public and private welfare provision can obviously increase simultaneously. It's not a zero sum game, but the potentially stronger social division of welfare can have unwanted political implications and possibly undermine future political support for a generous, generous universalistic welfare state. Add to this that welfare issues, which are always high on the agenda at every election, may get stronger competition for attention from other issues, such as many aspects of security, crime, environment, energy, and climate change. That's also a challenge for maintaining the kind of welfare state we have been used to have. Major challenges are associated with demographic change, aging of societies, low fertility rates, shrinking labor forces are well-known challenges to the future of tax bases and financing of the welfare state all over Europe. Family policies, pension reforms and investment in human capital have been and are on the agenda in the Nordic and all European countries. And, and these are all examples of political responses to the problem of future financial sustainability of welfare states. The need for manpower and long-term care services for the elderly will increase in coming decades and sustainable financing is a challenge. But on the other hand, the Nordic countries are technologically advanced and it's likely that technological innovations to some extent can alleviate the need for care workers. Through digital solutions, costs can be reduced and the quality of service provision improved. Home-based services can become easier and less costly. 
labor can become more efficient and effective and beneficiaries can more effectively receive and use information. Another concern related to dem demography is a relatively large scale immigration over a short period of time in recent decades, especially the high especially the increased number of asylum seekers has raised concern over the social and political cost of integration, as well as concern with lower labor force particip participation rates than that of the native populations. This may result in a lose-lose situation, lower tax revenues and higher social costs. Furthermore, tendencies towards increased wage dispersion and income inequality, as well as ethnic ethnical heterogeneity can affect not only the financial, but also the political sustainability of the welfare state. Research has indicated substantial scope of welfare chauvinistic attitudes, and some political parties thrive on anti-immigrant sentiments, even against labor immigrants who pay taxes and contribute to the well-being of both the economy and the welfare state. National active policies for integration, education, and labor markets are called for, as well as probably more, probably more European-wide common solutions to social rights for various types of migrants. The developed world Nordic welfare state represents a strong automatic stabilizer when faced with sudden international crisis of various kinds. The character of the welfare state has helped mitigate the social effects of negative income shocks. The experience of the current pandemic crisis is no exception, but also helped by the fact that the economic position of the Nordic countries was fairly strong before the pandemic. Temporary policies have, in, have been introduced to strengthen social protection and protecting the economy as a whole. One challenge is that the prolonged crisis can cause high levels of long-term unemployment and chronic economic insecurity. If this happens, it may give rise to new political initiatives for universal unconditional basic income solutions, both in the Nordic countries and in other European countries, and maybe even at the European EU level. I shall not here go in, argue for or against the many implications of the different types of basic income solutions when one can imagine. I think some of the other panelists will go into that debate. But, uh, but I only say that exceptional crisis of the kind we experience right now uh, can inspire radical social policy innovations as has happened before in history, in our history. Some politicians and observers claim that the pandemic will prove a setback for economic globalization and a return to more self-sufficient or protectionist nation states. Well, I think that the crisis has strengthened the case for having nation states with strong political, administrative, and economic capacities, I think another logical political response will be to further develop international cross-national cooperation for social protection and healthcare. One lesson learned or revisited is that health is a productive factor. Where our health is in danger, is in danger so are our economies. In Europe, the European Union has taken an initiative for creating a European health union which could be part of the European Social Union. It can be argued that there is a need for, European, for a European authority to strengthen re response capability for dealing with new and emerging, emerging cross-border threats to human health. The EU can also play a role in building national capacity to better prepare member states to deal with future crises. And I consider Norway to be a almost member state. Europe has a unique potential in the world to make regional security and healthcare, and to make regional cross-national policy innovations in the field of social protection, income security, and healthcare. And I think the Nordic countries can play a crucial role in this effort. Given the highly tax-based tax financing of Nordic and many other European welfare states, development of European and international cooperation to counter tendencies towards increased international tax competition also seem necessary in order to sustain advanced welfare states. Thank you. I hope that was within 10, 12 minutes. <laughs>
Stain, it was definitely close enough. Thank you for opening up, I would say, quite a comprehensive range of challenges. And also, though, offering some directions to what the possible responses can be. I again want to encourage everybody who is listening to please don't be shy and you know ask questions, give comments using the Q&A button that you find at the bottom of your screen with two little speaking bubbles. Um, Mina, the situation is now that at the moment we do not yet have questions from the audience. So I actually think the most you know, logical thing to do is to hand directly over to you because surely from your experience and position, you will be able to address and give us some more perhaps insight into the challenges just raised by Stain. I want to remind everybody who is listening to us that after Minna's presentation, we will be pausing for a bit of a Q&A on both Stain and Minna's presentations. So, um, engage with us. Let's have a dialogue. But for now, very pleased to have you here with us, Minna, and uh, the word is yours. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Uh, I will try to share with you a few, few slides. I hope I'm going to succeed in it. Maybe you can tell me if something goes wrong. Hopefully not. Um, my name is Minna Helle and I work in the technology industries of Finland. Um, technology industries is Finland's most important export sector. And now I will make a short presentation uh, from the labor market point of view to the challenges of, of the Nordic welfare state. Of course, I talk about Finnish perspective so what I'm saying might not totally uh, reflect the situations in other Nordic countries, because to some extent, uh, in my opinion, the Finnish labor market, uh, if we talk about how it has developed, is behind our Nordic uh, sister countries. Uh, unfortunately, we have not been able to develop it in, in, in the same um, to the same extent as, for example, in Sweden. So we are coming a little bit behind. But um, uh, here, is, here is what I, I'm thinking. First, uh, opportunities. Some opportunities that I see that are the cornerstone of the Nordic labor market and should be also in the, in the future. We have very high level of trust. And we have a very strong tradition in, in cooperation between the employers and employees. And this is something that we have been building on for decades. And I think we should continue to do so also in the future. Because if this works well, it gives the possibility to have uh, less tension in the labor market, less tension at the workplaces. And of course, it is something that we value to a very high extent also at the employer side. We have very good participation, participation possibilities for employees and very good working dialogue in the working places. And actually the technology industries of Finland is now willing to make this connection even stronger at the working place. So we have actually recommended to all our member companies that, that have over 50 uh, employees, that the companies should organize uh, employee representation in the company's decision-making bodies, because we want to make this uh, connection even stronger. We have strong innovation environment. We have very high level of education. We have a good cooperation between companies and universities. And we have a good infrastructure, uh, which is very good for innovation environment. And of course, technology brings new opp opportunities to develop productivity. And I think that when we talk about future work, it will even uh, give us possibility to have more meaningful jobs, uh, better salaries in the, in the long run, 
and world's best working environments, most modern working environments, most modern working cultures. And at least we in the technology industries of Finland, we strongly believe that this is something that we have to build on. And we believe that the employees are uh, at their best, most productive, if they have good conditions to, to work, if they have their possibilities to be heard and to make to have their own ideas going forward, we should have very um, modern uh, leadership culture. And because we have very low hierarchies in the Nordic companies, everybody can talk to each other and learn from each other. I think this is one of the main uh, main cornerstones in our working life that we should strengthen. And I believe that the future success of the Nordic companies, well, in the companies all over the world, but we have the best, best situation because of the low hierarchy and good cooperation and, and participation possibilities, that this is something that we could actually, um, uh, this could be a really big competitiveness uh, issue for, for the companies in the future. And we are going to, to make real effort for, for this to, to, to work. We also have the opportunity to develop a world's most efficient public sector. Uh, and for example, in the technology industries of Finland, we think that our role is not to look at our own sector's short time uh, benefits. We want to look at the benefit of the whole society in the long run. And this is something that we do in, in technology industry. Uh, so we will always want to look at the big, big picture and what is best for everybody, not only the companies in the short run, but for everybody in the long run. Uh, if we look at the challenges then, and now I, I'm trying to be a bit provocative in order to, to have a good discussion here. Um, there are a lot of challenges, of course. And one of the biggest challenges in the labor market is that the three tight decision-making systems system, at least in Finland, it is in a real big crisis. Uh, we have built the labor market system for decades by making uh, agreements at the central level between the trade unions, the employers' unions, and the politicians. And this doesn't work anymore because the employer side sees that there is a strong need to go to the local level, to have local agreements. Uh, the needs of the export companies differ very greatly. Competition is very harsh on the international labor market and in the international market. Uh, so it's not possible anymore to have one table on the central level, who knows what to do. We need to, to go to a more decentralized system. And in Finland, this has meant that uh, the three-partite decision-making is in a crisis and actually has not been able to make, make any substantial uh, changes, for example, in the labor legislation anymore. So the development of the legislation has, has frozen and uh, it's, it's a big, big problem. So can the tripartite decision-making system renew itself to the next level? How does it work in a world where actually we need more flexible systems, more agile systems and more local systems? This is something that we have not been able to solve in the Finnish labor market. Demographic changes, uh, Stein also talked about them. They call for structural changes in the economy. But now that the three party decision making doesn't work anymore, can the politicians do this? Can they make the renewals that are needed on the labor market, for example, to the social security system, to labor law, uh, and so on? And actually what has happened, at least in Finland, is that we are moving towards a more ideological political system and towards a block politics system. 
And this has meant for the last few years that the politicians have not been able to do any real changes, for example, in the social security system. They have been unable to, to solve the demographic, uh, the changes that the demographic changes call for to make the, the um, uh, make the financial system uh, uh, strong enough. Then the power shift in the labor markets. Uh, the employers want to go move towards a more local uh, agreement system, local collective agreements. And this has proven to be very difficult, at least in Finland. And my question is that do the unions, the employer unions and the employee unions really know what's best for you nowadays? Maybe they have done, been able to do it when we have been building the welfare society. But now that we should be able to adapt to the rapid changes in the working life in the international market and be, be very competitive all the time, we need tailor-made solutions in the company level. Uh, do the unions really know even now what is best for you? And this is, I think, the mo most difficult question for the social democratic thinking, which has built upon the idea that, that uh, the unions know what is best for you. But I don't think it is like that anymore. But especially the trade unions seem to think even now that they should be able to decide what are the good, good salaries and what is the best salary system or the best working times. And at the same time, there is a rise of, of uh, tailor, need for tailor-made solutions for the companies and for the employees as well. Uh, social security system, um, uh, Stein talked about radical social policy innovations. I really liked the term and I think we would need one right now because at least in Finland we have this earnings related social security system and so earnings related unemployment system. But are we actually securing so much that it has become unencouraging because the work, working life changes. And if you uh, lose your job, there might not, not be a similar job available. You should be able to have, uh, to move to a new sector, um, build your, for your education uh, and, and so on. So, at least to me, it seems that nowadays we are securing so much that we are actually securing people from going to work. And that is not a good, good idea when the working lives changes so much that we should all the time encourage people to, to learn something new, uh, go to, to new sectors and take care of their skills and, and so on. And uh, Stein also talked about state universalistic thinking. And, and I, here I see a really big problem because the social security system is something that the state in, in a welfare state takes care of. And it is also on the politician's um, responsibility to, to develop the social security system. But when the political decision-making is in a crisis and the three-party decision-making is in a crisis, are we able to, to make these radical social policy innovations in order to renew the social security system? That would, uh, the, the next level system should be more encouraging and, and, um, and maybe we should think it otherwise than, than we have had so far. And then the last point, the increasing skill gap and shortage of skilled workers. Uh, it's a big problem now. And at least in the technology companies, the companies say 
that it is most of the it is one of the biggest obstacles of growth nowadays and it's becoming worse all the time and this has something to do with the education system uh, is it agile enough no it's not how should we develop that and this is also a question that is related to to um, uh, immigrant issues we need more work related uh, immigrants from abroad and the companies are more willing to have more work related immigrants than the politicians are, are willing to have so there is also a, a something we need to need to solve in the future and it's becoming more difficult as stein says because of the anti-immigrant ideas that are also uh, something we see also in finland thank you Thank you very much, Minna. I think if we were thinking while listening to Stain that yes, there is indeed a broad range of challenges, I think you actually perhaps woke us up even more to see the concrete nature of these challenges. Um, to the audience, we are still you know, warmly inviting you to put questions in the Q&A, or you can also send a chat message to us panelists. In order, though, to, to get started now, a bit of a discussion here, Lars Peter, I would be very surprised if you would not have a question that you would like to put to either Stein or Minna. Well, thank you, Helen. Um, and thank you so for very interesting uh, uh, talks you, you both of you made. Uh, when listening very closely to what Minna said, particularly, I cannot help getting this uh, quite um, lively picture of a very transforming forces in the labor market that sets out a lot of challenges that are different from what they used to be and uh, challenging very much the collective solidarity uh, model uh, that was the old success story or as we talk about a lot a lot so what arises, and I, I, I know if we take that, your perspective, and look at what um, Stein was saying about the welfare state and all the possible dimensions of change that might be challenged there, there is certainly a lot of uh, dynamic meeting points. So with, if I would allow myself to, to just ask you one, one simple question out of all this, I would ask you, do we actually, because of the, the, the fundamental changing forces and, and how, how, how transforming they are, do we actually need to look for a new kind of a social contract in order to preserve the best uh, solidarity uh, that we have in the present Nordic model? Uh, well, that is a very difficult question. Maybe we should. Um, I think that we should. My ideal is that we would be able to develop things like all the time make changes to the system. But somehow this doesn't work. Uh, what happens in the labor market is that nothing happens in the structures but the world changes all the time. And uh, then we just go as we have, go what, do what we have done before in the structural level, and then something radical happens. This has happened in the fin Finnish labor market already because uh, one of the major export sectors, forest industry, actually made a decision last autumn that they, will, they won't do any collective agreements on the, on the sectoral level anymore. They, they said that all the agreements will be made on the, on the company level in the future, because they really didn't trust the system anymore, that it will produce some development to the structures, to, to the collective agreements. And in the technology industry, we are the biggest Export, export sector, 
we made a similar decision also, but uh, we are going to continue uh, making the uh, sectoral agreements also. And then we have also opened up the window for companies to make collective agreements on the, on the company level. So we have a hybrid, hybrid model. And these both decisions, they reflect the fact that the, we have not been able to, to make any structural changes in the labor market. So it's, I, I hope that everybody will wake up and, and look together what we should do and, and see the common interests. Because if we, if we take the radical steps, then we, we will maybe lose something from something really important from the Nordic welfare state that we actually don't want to lose because we want to keep the, keep the good cornerstones that we have. Can I say something? Or? Please. <laughs> yeah, I find it very fascinating talk by Minna and I think uh, there's a lot to pick up from her talk. Uh, and I also agree with Lars Pedersen. Maybe we, we might prepare for developing a new social contract, but still keeping the best of the Nordic model and Nordic welfare state as we know them. Uh, but I think, uh, as Minna said from uh, the Finnish experience, there may be more, more difficult to find this common political ground across the, poli uh, the, the political blocks. Maybe not so much in Norway, but still also there, I think. And we have more parties than necessary also, probably. But uh, on the other hand, so I mean, maybe we should uh, ask governments or provoke the governments to, to set up some uh, expert committees or, or also with interest representation to try to find out what is the problem or what are the problems and, and what can be possible solutions. I think. Uh, we know these problems on the labor market, changing labor market. I think that is a one big challenge. And, uh, and, uh, but in terms of elderly care and, and health and pensions, I think there's not so much a problem to define what the problem is. But labor market is a big challenge. And I think a common challenge, which we see all across the Nordic countries, either, even though they are all quite egalitarian in any global uh, comparison, uh, there's a growing concern with uh, inequalities and more differences between people. And I think that is also could be one starting point for governments to, to, to kind of find a kind of some common ground for, for different interests and different organizations and different experts to try to define what is a problem and possible solutions. That's a basis for a new social contract. <laughs> Thank you both of you and thank you also Lars Peter for stepping in here with a question. I think given that we have Johan coming up next on the topics of economic dynamism and competitiveness, I feel Johan that the discussion that we just embarked on kind of seems to very naturally open the door to what you are going to tell us or talk to us about next. So I think I would like to hand over the word to you, Juan, and please everybody remember, we still would love to see questions and comments because after Juan's talk, we will likely maybe take a clarifying question or two, then we'll hand over to Guy, but then we will still have, you know, a pretty substantial amount of time for a bit of discussion here today. But for now, Juan, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Elian. Uh, to begin with, I, uh, what Mina and Stein uh, spoke about here resonates quite a lot with me, and I think I'll try to uh, echo so, so, some of the points made here. And I'll also do my best to be even more provocative so that we get the discussion going. And um, let me start out by saying that uh, I, I'm coming from the Swedish perspective. And I'm a critical insider in the Swedish model. Uh, and I'm also trained as an economist, which makes me you know, a bit dismal. 
so that said, uh, I think we're facing some very turbulent times and we're facing some substantial changes to our uh, various versions of welfare models. And possibly, I'll try to end up in a point where I think that possibly, and unfortunately, the Nordic countries might be in somewhat different trajectories. And it actually plays into uh, how the labor markets are developing in very different ways. Uh, but by the end of the day, uh, it will all come down to what kind of political responses we get to the changing and the forces, forces of change we see. Um, and I was asked uh, by Lars Peter to talk about uh, the competitiveness uh, of our economies and the, the ability to generate economic renewal and dynamism in the economies. Uh, and essentially, I, I'll draw upon the research we do at Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum. And I'll try to focus on, uh, I tend to think about competitiveness in terms of productivity, value added, and the ability to generate growth and productivity. And that is ultimately what sustains our prosperity. So that's the way I, way I think about uh, competitiveness, and pro essentially in productivity terms. But I'll think of, talk about competitiveness in terms of outcomes. That is the uh, income we generate, the product production we generate, and GDP per capita, capita essentially. Uh, and that is the outcomes. And then we have activities in terms of trade, uh, entrepreneurial activities, innovations. So the economic activities that generates the economic outcomes. And then I talk about competitiveness fundamentals. Uh, and that is very much down to what Mina and Stein talked about. Uh, do we have efficient labor markets? Do, the, do we have the education system and actually supply the competences as, that the employers are seeking, etc. So those are the fundamentals. Uh, as well as what uh, Lars Peter mentioned it in his introductory remark, to, uh, where we are ranking in doing business climate, etc. So we start out, and I, I would like to emphasize that I, my picture, even though we have all these uh, Economist articles, uh, Financial Times articles over the last decade or so that says the Vikings are back. Uh, I think a famous article, or at least in the Nordic perspective, famous article in The Economist uh, was saying that, you know, it's a, the Nordic models are something to look, look up to. Uh, I tend to think that we are actually, uh, in a broad sense, we're not that competitive. And we are actually more mediocre uh, than you'd think. Uh, so if we look at the... Um, uh, the outcome in terms of income per capita. Uh, it looks decent. There is no doubt about it that uh, the Nordic countries, we're, we're all rich countries. Uh, so if you look at uh, in terms of GDP per capita in uh, uh, look at these uh, rank, OECD rankings, uh, Denmark is ranked number seven. Norway is, is the richest among us, uh, ranked number four. Finland is ranked number 14. Sweden is ranked number 12. This, you know, out of 200 countries globally makes us very affluent and very prosperous. Uh, but if we kind of take a step back and look at the comparison within the OECD group, it doesn't look as good. Then I would argue that maybe with the exception of Norway, it looks much more mediocre. And take Sweden, for example, Sweden uh, in the 1970s, we were uh, on number four at the same ranking as Norway today, but we dropped to rank number 12. And actually there are only two other countries in the world that has made a similar drop in the ranking uh, of income per capita. Uh, and this is coming back to what Mina and Stein said uh, earlier about labor market inefficiencies, a significant contribution to the drop in uh, income per capita in Sweden in relative terms is due to a highly inefficient labor market. Uh, on top of that, we can also see that we have a relatively slow productivity growth. Uh, partially, one expects a slower productivity growth in, uh, in countries when you're relatively rich, but I, don't, I would warn against getting too much fooled about, fooled by this. 
because there are inefficiencies that pulls down our prosperity. So that's, uh, that's the outcome. And we have a similar picture when looking at other you know, indicators of welfare, uh, social inclusions, we're uh, highly ranked there. Sustainability indicators were also highly ranked there. Then if we look at economic activities, uh, we get a somewhat different pat pattern across the Nordic countries. And for example, Sweden, I would argue, is possibly the Nordic country which has the strongest position in global value chains uh, with strong companies and a strong uh, anchoring in the global economy with notable exceptions. Denmark, for example, has uh, positioned itself very strongly in life science. Uh, so we, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, looking at other indicators of our ability to generate prosperity and welfare, uh, which I would together with many ar other argue that entrepreneurship is probably a key, key factor. Uh, and unfortunately, the, these indicators are not available for all years across all the Nordic countries. But if you look, go back and uh, look uh, on the numbers that are, in fact, are available, uh, again, we come out uh, as mediocre. Uh, if we, we have, uh, in the broadest measure by Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, uh, we actually come out as uh, at the half as much entrepreneurship as compared to, let's say, the US. So there is a significant scope for improving conditions for firms and entrepreneurial dynamics in the Nordic countries. Uh, on top of that, I would argue that, uh, and particularly Sweden, maybe you correct me if you disagree or if I'm wrong, but uh, at least in the Swedish case, we also have a significant scale up problem that despite that we do have uh, well-known uh, high-tech companies that become unicorns and start up and uh, Klarna and Spotify and others. We still have quite robust numbers saying that we do have a scale-up problem that is difficult to, uh, to enter a global market for small and medium-sized firms and actually grow. Uh, and part of this is uh, the institutional framework. Part of it is the that we are, we are in fact uh, small countries with a small domestic market, which creates additional scale up problems. So again, in terms of economic activities, we're doing okay, but we're far from the best in the world in, uh, if you look at these indicators. And then if you look at uh, is what is more competitiveness fundamentals, such as access to human capital, the labor market, uh, how efficient that works. And we did actually, uh, last year, we did a significant job at the Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum. We went through uh, some 70 broad set of indicators, including the indicators that uh, Lars Peter mentioned, looking at and benchmarking Sweden vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest of the world. So we looked at the World Economic Freedom Index and its components. Uh, in that Denmark is ranked number 10, Finland, uh, Sweden is number 21, Finland 17, Norway 28, uh, making us mostly free economies, but we're far from the frontier. And the same go story goes for uh, if you take the more, perhaps more well-known and more widely used set of indicators on ease of doing business by the World Bank. Uh, Denmark is number 10, Norway 9, uh, Denmark for Finland number 20. So it dispersion in the ranking in the Nordic countries. But if you actually go into the details and look at uh, the underlying index, we're actually much closer than that reveals. And we are quite far from uh, the institutional frontier, so to speak. Uh, um, so behind this, I think there is a significant scope for institutional improvement in order to boost our competitiveness. Uh, and at least in the Swedish case, and listening to Mina, maybe that's the case in uh, other Nordic countries as well, uh, the labor market is the single most important source for inefficiencies uh, in the Swedish model. Uh, and to sort of wrap up here, 
uh, I think we are we are facing substantial challenges as to uh, how we how the at least the Swedish welfare model works. I think we're uh, echoing staying here. I think we're moving in a period where the support for a universal welfare state is dwindling. Uh, I'm afraid that we might be in a situation where uh, trust levels are going down, uh, in particular in some areas of Sweden, trust levels are going down. We have survey evidence that trust levels are starting to shift in varying extent across regions in Sweden. Uh, and just to give you some uh, hard numbers on the challenges that coming into the, the more sensitive or controversial topics, uh, looking at the uh, the impact migration has had on the Swedish welfare model. Uh, Sweden is currently uh, having uh, a majority of non-Nordic immigrants, a majority of non-Nordic immigrants uh, working age are not self-sufficient. And this is uh, individuals 20 to 64 year olds uh, we're talking about low estimates in the range of somewhere between six and 700,000 uh, are not self-sufficient. Uh, and this is roughly 13 to 14 or possibly 15% uh, of the workforce that is not self-sufficient. Uh, and this is uh, causing, as you, I'm sure you're familiar with, some interesting political turbulence and the political responses to this are, uh, well, well, we'll see where it goes. Uh, but I, uh, coming back what Stein said, we, I think we are going into a period where we will uh, more and more talk about the role of nation states and we have different trajectories to how we think about the nation state. And don't get me wrong, I'm not encouraging and I'm not looking forward to it, but I wouldn't be surprised if Sweden in a reasonable amount of time, uh, we enter in a discussion with, which we had in the UK, which is going to be on a Swexit. Uh, I think that's good. maybe never come to pass, but I think we will have such a discussion coming on the political agenda. Uh, and to sum up, I, uh, I think the universal welfare state is being substantially challenged. I'll stop there. And hopefully I was a bit provocative. Thank you, Johan. I think if there is one message coming out loud and clear from what all of you are saying, then that there is good reason to think ahead about what might be the possible scenarios for the Nordic model. And how do we, in the different functions that we have, want to take action? Um, I am... Um, once more, I start sounding a little bit here like a, a broken record. And I'm very grateful that we just had a test question here confirming that our Q&A function is indeed functioning. Um, we would love it if you were to also offer some questions for the you know, panel the discussion, the debate that we will have at the end of today's webinar. Uh, we soon guy we soon have the privilege to have an outside view here on the future of work in the nordics i believe that i will soon be giving the word to you i just wanted to pause before that though and see since at this moment there are not any questions from the audience i just want to see whether one of the other panelists wanted to perhaps ask johan a follow-up question before we then continue on to guy There are plenty of questions to ask of Johan, um, but it's probably better that I wait until um, I've said my little piece um, and then we, we have a discussion thereafter. Thank you, Guy. And actually, Stig, Arne, we're very glad to have the first question here from, from the audience, um, who is actually asking about something that I have an inkling that Guy is going to come to this topic of... Um, Minstelen in Norwegian, which I believe would be basic income. 
in English. And uh, so the question, guys, is already now on the table, whether our panelists see a basic income as a challenge for the Nordic model. Um, I will just see, you know, is there is there anybody else who wants to chip in something as a follow up to your talk, be it Stein, Minna or Johan? And otherwise, yes, OK, Stein. And Minna. Okay, Guy, you'll have to wait a little bit more. Can we have first a comment from Stein, please, and then from Minna? Just, well, just a brief comment. I mean, uh, minimum, in, uh, minimum, minimum income is, uh, or minimum, minimum salary is uh, a Nordic exception in the in European context. And I think the trade union movement in the Nordic countries has want to have this right to negotiate salaries and income and not leave it to the politicians to decide. So I think they want to keep on that, that this is really one part of the Nordic model. But then again, this can change over time. If trade unions uh, continue to lose some strength, it's, uh, which is, I think it's apparent, then that might change. But at the moment, I think this is one of the things which also keeps relatively high union membership in the Nordic countries, that they still have some of these possibilities to negotiate with employers. So that's part of the Nordic model, I think. And thank you, Stein, actually, for correcting me in my Norwegian understanding here. I just realized the question, obviously, is about EU minimal salary. Apologies for making pre uh, mature associations. Minna, your comment on this question. Yes, uh, thank you, Helen. Um, I agree with Stein that actually both the employers and the employees, at least in Finland, want to keep the current system where we have the minimum wages in the collective agreements. But if we are unable to renew the collective agreements sufficiently and the employers lose their trust on the collective agreement system on the sectoral level, and we will have maybe in the future more um, company level collective agreements. Then I think the discussions on the min minimum wage uh, legislation will, will give, become even more relevant in, in the future. So I, I'll see that there is, a, there is a link. And also when we talk about radical social policy innovations that Stein talked about, uh, I think in the future, we also have to discuss uh, what should we do to the social security system? Should we have some kind of, of minimum social security um, system there? Because, for example, in the service sector fields, the, the wages uh, cannot be very high because of the low productivity. And maybe we need some kind of minimum social security compensation that goes together with the with the minimum wage in order for people to, to have a decent standard of living. That's, that's one possibility uh, to discuss in the future. But for now, we, we have this earnings related system, but it has its problems because it can be very disencouraging when we talk about employment. So this, this, is, this is very important discussion actually both minimum wage and 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 um, minimum social security i'm just raising guy that we also have two other questions here and i'm just checking whether you are seeing those we have one set of questions from halvard lund around dignity through hiring in innovation with three questions where the first is, does hiring create value in itself? Secondly, could we have a model with progressive contracts starting on 5% and increasing every second month? And then is the dignity of being hired enough to create innovation? Um, that was one set of thought provoking question. We then also have a comment from Axel Röd saying here, very interesting introduction so far. I was wondering about your perspectives on how other European welfare states 
have been impacted by recent economic and societal developments? Are the Nordic welfare states becoming more similar to other European welfare states? Maybe. Um, and sorry, I will take one last one and then, <laughs> then the other questions will need to wait for the group discussion in the end. There was also a question from Halvard whether we could have a system where every unemployed person are obliged to create their own company or similar. All right, here are the radical suggestions coming. Um, I'm just pausing to see whether any of the panelists would like to give a brief comment on one of these questions that now came from the audience before I pass the ball to Guy. I can, I can say very briefly on the, on the question of other European states' response to the, the pandemic um, and welfare support. Well, let me give you the British example, um, which has been appalling, uh, frankly. Um, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but there was a consolidation um, of welfare uh, payments under the umbrella of something called universal credit um, that lumped together lots of what were individual payments into one thing and universal in credit now includes things like what was formerly unemployment benefit and uh, depending on your financial situation uh, if you're unemployed you can apply for some universal credit up to a maximum of about a thousand pounds a month so about ten thousand kroner eleven thousand kroner uh, in Norway um, and clearly that's not enough to live off uh, for, for anyone, uh, particularly not, not if you've got a family uh, and children. Um, and the UK government's response during the pandemic was to increase that amount by £20 a week, 200 kroner. Um, so when I look at the, um, the Nordic welfare states um, against this backdrop, you uh, probably all imagine that I see a dreamland um, where things couldn't be any better uh, because as a journalist, I've seen terrible, terrible poverty and destitution, which is the flip side of the coin um, in, um, in the UK. There's great wealth, but there's, there's great poverty as well. And I also stood as a political candidate in 2019 and, and saw the same, same thing. So in, yes, there are problems. And some of these I'm going to come to in my little presentation in, in, in the Nordic model when it comes to welfare but nowhere near as severe as you see anywhere else uh, in, in the European Union, I don't think. You don't get the extremes of, of, of uh, wealth and poverty. Uh, you have the compressed wage structure, for example. You have that welfare support, and that just doesn't really exist um, anywhere else, certainly not to the same degree in the European Union, let alone elsewhere in the world. Okay. Isn't it typical that as, you know, we're, we're, we're drawing a bit closer to the end of today's session, the discussion starts bubbling, Johan, I saw you have your hand up, but then I also saw you take it down. So shall we say so that we now give Guy the floor? By the way, apologies, Guy, I believe you are Irish. And I think I mistakenly said we have an English speaker, which is the language you're speaking, but perhaps, you know, <laughs> should not be used to describe you as a person. Uh, I am we... Irish indeed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like the Irish, so that makes me happy. Um, really glad to have you here. I think we will now give you the floor for about 10 minutes, which means we'll still have, you know, over a 10 minutes in the end for then a group discussion. Okay, thanks very much. And um, yes, my, my little presentation will be in some ways a summary of what others have said, um, but hopefully with a few more things to think about. Uh, as I've said, I'm a, I'm a journalist. It's my job really to find fault with things, um, a professional fault finder. Um, and um, I see some faults in the Nordic model, but I also see some opportunities. I think the core fault or the core challenge um, everywhere in the world, but particularly in, in, in the Nordic countries where life's been pretty good in recent decades, is to avoid the temptation to wait and see, to wait for reform, in other words, particularly when it comes to macroeconomic policy. Um, I think the, the kind of the political strategy in Nordic countries in recent decades has been what I call the Angela Merkel strategy, um, which is um, the heart shaped fingers. Let's just see what happens. Um, and um, eventually things will settle down and we'll come to a consensus. The problem with that, if you look at Germany, um, is that German digital infrastructure 
the energy sector and even their core industry, car and automotive manufacturing is lagging way behind the competition. Tesla is now the world's most valuable car uh, company. Um, it's dwarfing German car manufacturers and they're panicking terribly. And they have too many employees and they focus for too long in, on internal combustion when everyone knows they should have been changing over to electric. Um, the same thing happened in the 80s and 90s in the UK with heavy industry. It would be a disaster for the same thing to happen uh, in the Nordics. But unfortunately, I do see something of the same thing happening uh, here in Norway, for example, where I'm sitting today in, in, in Oslo, where the key economic engine, uh, one of the key economic engines is spluttering oil and gas, obviously. Yet the temptation still is to fix this engine with bailouts and subsidies and so on, other means of stimulus, even while ever fewer companies and investors see opportunity uh, in, in, that, in that industry. So what's going on here? Well, I think policymakers have already been waiting for too long. Um, I say they should avoid the temptation to wait and see, but they've already been doing that for too long. Um, and um, this, even while it's evident that there are, again, in Norway, I'll give an example, there are plenty of opportunities to stimulate new, huge new macroeconomic opportunities. And I think one of the key ones is energy infrastructure um, here in, in Norway, where there is desperate need for investment and upgrading as more and more electricity is required in industry in the domestic setting and for, you know, for transport, uh, for example. So just think what a difference uh, the government could have achieved here in their pandemic response had they opted for a kind of new deal for renewable energy infrastructure. Um, it would have begun to fix that um, would have begun to fix that, uh, that, that, that domestic problem, but also spurred the transition away from oil and gas uh, services and, and infrastructure companies to renewable energy uh, services and infrastructure companies. And clearly there's a massive, massive global market for that. Um, fortunately, I think there's, and as we've heard, there are certain expectations and traditions uh, in the Nordic model that make it quite easy for states up here in the North um, to do some pretty radical macro macroeconomic stuff. Um, the state is pretty large in the Nordics uh, and it's therefore has, it has permission, uh, so to speak, to invest heavily in new sectors, um, even high risk ones. And that's necessary um, because big economic shifts are by definition quite high risk. Um, the challenge though, is to make sure that um, when that happens, the state does invest heavily in those high risk sectors that the profits from those initial investments flow back into, into state coffers rather than private po pockets. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, there's a flip side to this, this coin. Um, I talked about the major challenge or problem I see. Uh, the major opportunity I see um, is the welfare side of things. Um, so you have the macroeconomic side of things, you have the welfare side of things. And there, I really do think that with these sprawling welfare states that are very expensive to run, um, the major opportunity is with basic income. And notice I don't say universal basic income, I say basic income, by which I mean it only really works out as a benefit for people who are either unemployed or on very, very low salaries. It's an opportunity uh, for simplifying welfare payments, uh, for ushering in more equitable approaches to taxation, for supporting the kind of continuing education and training that everyone's going to have to do as the pace of change, technological change, workplace change only accelerates in the, in the coming, decade, uh, coming decades. And also to support community cohesion. We've heard talk already about the loss of trust and the basically the breakdown of community and society um, that uh, Johan was talking about in Sweden, particularly. And I think that um, with this basic payment, uh, basic income payment, you could begin to re reverse some of that rot, that social rot. I'm going to take a bit of a sort of philosophical step now and talk about the social contract. Um, Minna was was given this question a little bit a little while ago by Lars Peter. Um, I was going to chip in there, but I'll, I thought I'd wait until now. Um, it never was the state's guarantee that it would provide a minimum income to its citizens. That's not how social contracts have worked up, up to now. Social contracts are typically about freedoms from, you know, protection against violence um, and, uh, and aggression from other people in the state, but also from the state itself. Um, although it should be said that this kind of concept of natural rights is the basis of human rights. 
I should say that I'm I'm looking at this this whole issue from the perspective of, of a liberal um, and one who believes very much in the importance of individual responsibility. But I think we have to be honest and admit that individualism has or can have a tendency uh, to do more harm than good um, because it's a perspective or attitude that can come to mean looking out for yourself more uh, and at the expense of, of others, which clearly is not a very liberal outcome. Um, and I think that modern individualism has come to compromise many of the moral sentiments that greats like Adam Smith thought so essential to, to the proper functioning of economies and societies, things like compassion, empathy and, and, and fairness. And even neoliberals like Hayek uh, thought that no matter how free and ruthless the competition, a basic moral sense should underpin all commercial and social activity. I think I prefer now to think in terms of individuality, um, of being able to express your own desires and wishes, of being able to live the kind of life that you want to live. Uh, and you can't do any, any of that without a certain, certain amount of stability, chiefly financial, assuming that there are no other covert, coercive forces at play. And we live in free societies here, so that's, you know, that's a given. And I think where the general will of society wants that individuality, as I've expressed it just now, um, there is a justification for the, for the state to provide that kind of mechanism, that kind of financial stability, um, as a means to guaranteeing a certain dignified and pleasurable and successful standard of living. Um, some of you will have heard of, of, of John Rawls, um, a thinker who considered the notion of the social contract in terms of what he called the veil of ignorance. In other words, what would everyone want in the absence of any kind of external influence? Um, and human rights would all occur to us, you know, basic rights would all, all occur to us as being very desirable. Um, but the thing is that we don't live behind a veil of ignorance. Um, we live at a time in history when we're more connected than ever before and we're more aware than ever before of each other, but also our impact on people elsewhere in the world. Whatever I do here in Norway, whatever I throw away here in Norway or consume here in Norway has an impact on somebody on the other side of the world. And then eventually there's a feedback loop and that impacts on me once again. Um, so I think that we can't avoid in the modern social contra contract uh, taking or, or acknowledging this, this, this reality of the, the international nature of societies today. In other words, in a sense, the social contract has to be a global one. Um, and that is a pretty mind-blowing concept con to consider uh, where governments and societies operate on a national basis. I've talked about the macroeconomic issue and, and the welfare issue. I've talked about this kind of philosoph philosophical change that's probably going to ha have to happen, um, but which I think is eminently possible, given that people are aware and there is this general will for a an individual way of living, but how then do you, how do you make this a reality? Um, how do you support people to be able to take advantage um, of, of what, you, what you offer to them as a state uh, under the Nordic model? Um, now, clearly economic, uh, macroeconomic policy is going to differ by, by country, but as I've said before, I think the key thing is the preparedness. Uh, there has to be a preparedness to invest in high risk new sectors. Um, but you have to ensure, as I said before, that the profits from that flow back into state pockets and not private pockets. Um, one way of doing this is to reform taxation. So to tax things like immovable assets, land, rents, inher inheritance, dividends, that would go some way to achieving this. Perhaps the bigger thing uh, is to curb what I'll call the increasing financialization of profits, by which I mean corporations turning profits into financial instruments. The tripartite system can go some way uh, to addressing that by making investment in education and training part of the bargaining process, alongside traditional things like wages and conditions. Um, but another bigger thing is to uh, encourage companies through incentives uh, to uh, investigate, uh, so invest in, in capital assets and research and development, um, a significant proportion of profits into those things, I think. I think a final thing, but certainly no less important than all of what I've just said, is to think about education. Um, it's surely the third pillar that holds up the socioeconomic platform. Um, but in many jurisdictions, I think education is still pretty antiquated. You know, kids sit in rows uh, in a classroom and they look at a, a board 
it might be a digital board these days, but they look at a board and they learn facts um, and then they learn the way to articulate those facts and they write them down in an exam and they get a grade for it, um, which is good in an abstract sense, um, but it's not very good preparation for life. Um, it doesn't really prepare you very well for the world of work and for life in general, where skills like resourcefulness, being enterprising, being entrepreneurial, um, are really what get you through uh, life and what and what enable you to open up doors to professional opportunities and other opportunities in, in your in your life. Now, this is a this is a a, a a question that pedagogues, educationalists have been struggling with for decades, um, and um, apparently not very successfully because we see this reversion to traditionalism to this very traditional way of teaching um, in in schools, um, but that doesn't mean that that pedagogues, educationalists, policy makers shouldn't try again to find a way of integrating the facts and the figures, the book learning, so to speak, with these broader social and professional skills uh, that people need to have, particularly now more than ever before, when it's very likely that people are going to have several careers. They're gonna to have to learn new skills. They're gonna to have to engage in education continually throughout their working lives. And they're gonna to have to work for a long time. Um, so to summarize, the Nordic model and the people who live under its various incarnations, I think are in a strong position to innovate in, in, in the realms of macro, macroeconomic and welfare policy, providing they don't wait for too long uh, for that to happen. I think the potential of these innovations implies a need to reassess the scope and the significance of the, of the social contract. But with these technical and philosophical foundations in place, practical action in terms of education and training will enable individuals and societies to take advantage of of the liberating impact of new economic prospects and a, a simplified, a far simplified, yet still dignified welfare policy. Thank you, Guy, for quite a tour of observations, ideas, and suggestions. Um, I think for, for just a, a quick stimulation here of dialogue, Johan, what is your view on basic income. The devil is in, thank you. The devil is in the detail. And I think we, uh, we could spend quite a time on talking about this, but uh, I'd say basic income, it sounds good, but uh, how do we design it? How do you qualify for basic income? Uh, what are the limitations on it? Uh, and one critical question for me would be, would it be used to simplify our current systems? So we would basically replace our social security agencies, our employment agencies and make literally thousands in Sweden, literally thousands of people in uh, bureaucracies unemployed uh, and simply make things more efficient then I would consider it. But I, I would argue that, uh, I think it's utopian. If we take this, and maybe here the case is different in the, uh, in the Nordic, different in the Nordic countries. Um, in the Swedish case, we have more than 700,000 uh, full-time equivalents. Uh, that is people that fu fully live on uh, benefit programs in the working age population. So think about this, 10 million people in the country, about 5 million are working age, 20 to 64. 700,000 are living fully on benefits. Uh, and on top of this, we have subsidized uh, employment opportunities for a large chunk of uh, another group of people. Uh, and then we have uh some individuals going into the education system even though they don't want to go in there uh because they can't find a job uh if we could address this by having universal income uh sure but i think we need to think into much more in terms of uh and maybe echoing what mina said earlier here about incentivizing the labor market to create stronger incentives uh, to get the right education, take responsibility for lifelong learning, actually reduce reservation wages. And we're not talking about 
you know, going in full-fledged unregulated labor, labor market, I'm saying that we need to move in a bit more liberal direction. Then I think to provoke uh, Guy a bit here, I think you're reversing causality uh, when you're saying that basic income could uh, create cohesion and uh, increase trust levels. I actually think it's the other way around. I think you need to have a very strong cohesive society. You have to have very high trust levels to introduce basic income. So I think I'm reversing that. And that makes me very skeptical for, uh, for the prospects in Sweden. But if I can assume the role of moderator, could I ask a question to Mina? I think Finland did an experiment on this. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Johan. We, we have been having an experiment, a pilot about basic in income. And so far, the results have been um, not so encouraging because it can happen that it's nice to have the money, but then it's, it's not easy to say if it has a, any effects, if it really has the right incentives, it, if it really encourages people to, to seek for, for jobs, go to, go, to, go to work. So this is not very clear on the basis of our pilots, if it really has this kind of positive effect or not. But I must say, I'm not the best expert on, on this pilot. And I, I, I agree with you, Johan, about the, about the boundaries. And, and um, I'm really, uh, I think it's an interesting thought and I think we should look at it, the basic income, but the devil is definitely in the details. If it could make things simpler and have more incentives and encourage people to, to uh, educate themselves, seek for new jobs, go to other sectors to work and so on, then it would be great. But I'm not sure if it can be done, but something must be done to the social security systems. And we need, again, I say for the third time, a radical social policy innovation. How do we construct this unemployment benefits, social security benefit system. We need to have the new system, but no one knows what it could be. It's, it's maybe a Nobel Prize worth question if, if we can solve that mm -hmm. <laughs> in the modern society. Thank you, Mingna, for once more making us all alert to the fact that there are so many highly, highly relevant questions on the table. I think, Lars Peter, I'd like to hand over to you now to also perhaps guide our audience into seeing how this is part of a larger process, the whole Nordic scenario initiative. So, Lars Peter, what would you like to share as concluding observations for today's session? Well, uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, I don't need to say too much about the perhaps the scenario project, which this meeting is part of, but certainly what has been presented here will provide inputs to a, 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 a sequence of meetings that will actually evolve into a scenario report, uh, trying to, to, to look at different futures for, uh, for, 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 the, for the Nordic uh, uh, models. And, uh, but I, I think what I would, um, in try, trying to to, uh, to to say something uh, at the end here, I would, it seems to be that one one thing only one thing is certain. That we do not we do not wish for we don't need to wish for a better past, it, but it's really a challenge going forward. And we have seen I think all presentations have have made it clear that we we need to get up to speed in terms of providing a new economic and social infrastructure for, for individual freedom and for, for social justice and economic prosperity in the future. It, 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 and we are really in the middle of these transforming changes that we need to think new. And that is my big take really from, from, from all what we are saying. And, um, and there's so many, important um, ideas that have come up in your presentations that 
I think, can only uh, have the benefit of being uh, put forward in, in many discussions going, going, going on further, further ahead. But unfortunately, we do not have too much time left now, I think, Helen. So uh, um, from my part, I would like to, to, to extend my heart thank, heartly thanks to, to all the pa panelists for, for your insightful uh, presentations and the ideas you share with us. And I'm sure they will be taken good care of in, in, the, in, in the project going forward. Helen? Thank you very much. And indeed, we have come to the end for now. So here you see the dates where the discussion will be continuing. Already, actually, on the 18th of May, we will talk about the Nordics and sustainability, Norden och hållbarhetsfrågor, in a webinar which will be led by the Think Tank Forest. As you see here, again, this whole initiative is a collaboration by five different Nordic think tanks. So we hope to see many of you either on the 18th of May or on the 2nd of June, or then also at the final seminar in November. And more information uh, can also be had, of course, on the web pages of these institutions. So thank you very much again for attending today and a big warm thank you to our panelists for, yeah, at least in me, raising a lot of questions and uh, making me more alert to following the debate on these topics going forward. Thank you very, very much. much for today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.